Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's an enormous pleasure to be delivering the Colin Matthew lecture in both his academic work and public service. Professor Matthew's life and work seems to be, it seems to be a model for the public historian. Not only was there <laughs> deep scholarship, uh, the work on, on Gladstone, the editing of the life, um, the work on Rosebury, but also a strong conviction uh, of the merits of applying that knowledge to the public sphere, whether at the National Portrait Gallery uh, or, as we've heard, the, the Dictionary uh, of National Biography. And it's a particular pleasure to be delivering a lecture on a subject rarely out of public discourse in the UK, the legacy and meaning of the British Empire. Uh, indeed, um, at a time when we are post-Brexit almost returning to the liberal imperialism of Matthew's uh, uh, history of Rosebury and Chamberlain and the crimson thread of kinship. Uh, it makes an appreciation of our colonial past and its meaning, I think, more urgent than ever. So let me start this evening at the, the formal point of its ending. On the 30th of June 1997, after the 99-year lease on the new territories came to an end, Great Britain handed back Hong Kong to the People's Republic of China. At the stroke of midnight, the Union flag was lowered to the strains of God Save the Queen. The Hong Kong police ripped the royal insignia from their uniforms and Red Army troops poured over the border in their jeeps. Steaming out of Victoria Harbour, as the Royal Marines played Rule Britannia and Land of Hope and Glory, on the last symbolic voyage of the Royal Yacht Britannia, although it might be resuscitated soon, we don't know, Britain's last governor, former Conservative Party chairman Chris Patton, wrote, That night we were leaving one of the greatest cities in the world, a Chinese city that was now part of China, a colony now returned to its mighty motherland in rather different shape to that in which it had become Britain's responsibility a century and a half before. But in London, the atmosphere was altogether shriller. The handover of Hong Kong to China strikes many Westerners as a disgrace and a tragedy, thundered The Economist. Never before has Britain passed a colony directly to a communist regime that does not even pretend to respect conventional democratic values. The diaries of Alistair Campbell, Prime Minister Tony Blair's Director of Communications, describes the scene amongst the UK delegation preparing for the ceremonial. When someone referred to the Chinese as the Dewhursts of Peking, there was a mild laugh around the table. I looked at Chris Patton a bit bemused. Dewhursts, as in butchers, he said. Campbell thought it all very self-indulgent. But when he caught sight of the Chinese soldiers, he was hit, as he said, by the full awfulness of the handover. Then the flag came down and theirs went up and it was all pretty sick. Tony Blair hated it and it showed a little. I can't believe that we could not have kept it. In his own memoirs, Tony Blair recalls of the ceremony, quotes, a tug, not of regret, but of nostalgia for the old British Empire. He admits to a startling failure to appreciate the historic significance of the return of Hong Kong as a rising, newly prosperous China sought to take its place in the world and shed the memory of its century of humiliation at the hands of British, French and American forces. There's, a, there's also this story of when Tony Blair, the, the newly elected Prime Minister, he goes over in, in 97 for, for the handover on an old VC-10, 10-hour 10, 10 uh, flight, crossover, all the rest of it. Um, and the, he arrives incredibly tired and jet-lagged. Um, and the Chinese premier thought he would test out Tony Blair's knowledge of Shakespeare, um, which was never strong to begin with, and after a 10-hour flight, uh, even weaker. But there was one member of the British delegation keener to cling on to the past. In a confidential diary entry entitled The Great Chinese Takeaway, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales laid bare his despair at seeing the Crown Colony return to the mainland. Watching another piece fall from his family inheritance, the prince lamented, quotes, the ridiculous rigmarole of meeting the old waxwork Yang Zemin and the horror of watching an awful Soviet-style ceremony in which Chinese soldiers goose-step onto the stage and haul down the Union Jack. And it's so heartening the Prince of Wales no longer makes these kind of gaffes today. 
Charles Philip Arthur George Mountbatten Windsor knew all too well that when his time came to assume the throne, the loss of Hong Kong meant Britain's imperial role would be long past. Such is the end of empire, I sighed to myself. But if the British Empire has indeed come to an end, its legacies remain nonetheless apparent all around the world. And amongst the most compelling of those phenomena still with us is the chain of former colonial cities from Dublin to Mumbai, Melbourne to New Delhi to Singapore. After sporting pastimes in the English language, urbanism, according to Jan Morris, is arguably, quotes, the most lasting of the British imperial legacy. And so what my book seeks to do is to explore the imperial story through the urban form. Ten cities that tell the rise and fall of the British Empire and chart the changing character of British imperialism through the urban form, through the streets, uh, the architecture, uh, the urban rituals, the governance, the politics um, of the city. The history of these cities also expose, I think, how understandings of imperialism changed across time and space. At times, Britain was a mercantilist empire, at other times, free trading. In certain periods, Britain was involved in a process of promoting Western civilization, at other points, defending multicultural relativism. As Joseph Conrad's Marlowe acerbically notes in Heart of Darkness, it was an idea that had to redeem the practice of empire at any particular point. An idea at the back of it, not a sentimental pretense, but an idea and an unselfish belief in the idea, something you can set up and bow down before and offer a sacrifice to. And so the ambition of the book is to explain how those ideologies of empire were made flesh through the city. And in the process, I hope, move our debate on in the public sphere from this sort of good and bad history of imperialism, this binary approach where we've seen um, Neil Ferguson celebrating the sort of modernizing energy of empire and other authors, most recently Richard Gott, sort of chronicling the story uh, of British imperialism simply uh, as an account uh, of genocide and theft and carnage. And the danger is, is that as the history of empire moves into the legacy of court cases and official inquiries, some of the suppleness that historians should seek to apply to the past is being lost. As Linda Colley has suggested, one of the reasons why we all need to stop approaching empire in simple good or bad thing terms and instead think intelligently and inquiringly about its many and intrinsic paradoxes is that versions of the phenomenon are still with us. And I think it is this very complexity of the urban past, this question of interaction and adaptation, which allows us to go beyond some of the good and bad cul-de-sac debates uh, of so much uh, of imperial discourse. The history of colonialism studied, covered in this study suggests a more diffuse process of exchange, interaction and adaptation, and one which shaped us as much as we shaped the world. So what does the history of these cities reveal? My story begins on the eastern seaboard um, of America um, with the city of Boston, where in the early 17th century, a band of Puritans sought to build a New England out of the, the fallen Laudian Stuart Catholic Old England. Uh, and through a mixture of commercial enterprise and a demand uh, for religious liberty, they sought to create a city on a hill, uh, as Governor Winthrop famously uh, put it, drawing on much imagery which was there amongst the sort of Essex Puritans of the late 16th, early 17th century. And I love this, this early map um, of Boston because what you, what you see in the midst of it um, is just what a small, tight environment Boston was connected to the mainland uh, with just uh, a slither um, uh, of land. I'm going to see if this is a, is this a, no, that's, that's not what that was. <laughs> I thought that was going to be a, uh, uh, a doctor thing. Um, all of this, much of this land is now um, infilled 
uh, it was in Phil during the uh, 19th um, and 20th century. Um, oh, excellent, thank you so much. Um, so here's our little slither of land, uh, and then uh, uh, Boston, this, this, this tight place. And Boston sort of emerges um, in the 17th century, uh, initially uh, through the desire for religious liberty and religious freedom, unless, of course, you're a Quaker, and they weren't so liberal on that. Um, but it quickly becomes this great trading uh, uh, city, a vibrant transatlantic commerce in cod, whale oil, silverware, tea, cotton, coffee, uh, etc. And why I love this image is you see both the, the chapels uh, and the churches uh, of Boston, the busyness uh, of this port. Actually, these are British troops being landed, uh, but also uh, uh, the busyness um, of, uh, of the port. And Boston, as an imperial city, is in so many ways an English city. This is a city like York. Uh, this is a city like Exeter, like Newcastle. This is a city where uh, they read The Spectator. This is a city where they go to the same plays. This is where it is an Anglican culture. It is a loyal, uh, royal city. And what is more, Boston grows rich on the growth of the British Empire. Boston grows as a city in the provisioning of the great wars that the Royal Navy were embarking upon uh, against the British uh, and the French uh, during the 17th uh, and particularly the 18th uh, uh, century. So, as it were, as a colonial city, this is also, in a sense, a, a, an English and then British uh, city. But then what happened um, was that, um, as, as British politicians uh, uh, tend to do, um, um, we, we, we asked, um, we asked the, the good people of Boston to pay uh, some tax uh, for the riches they were enjoying from the protection of the Royal Navy. Um, and initially, the, 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 the uh, uh, taxes, the Stamp Act, initially uh, taxes uh, on publications, playing cards, newspapers. And I absolutely adore this image because th this, this image, I mean, it's, it's scandalous that a member of Parliament for Stoke on Trent has shown up at sort of ceramic ware made in Derby, but I'm feeling, I'm feeling, I'm feeling generous. Um, the, 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 what, what you have here is an account both of the, the, the kind of trade which existed between uh, Britain and America, and also a brilliantly enterprising uh, ceramicist in Derby thinking, well, there's a great market uh, on the eastern seaboard for sort of, you know, anti-British sentiments. So I'll stick no stamp act and export this out of Liverpool over to Boston, where I think the market um, is, is growing. Um, so when uh, um, the, 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 um, uh, the stamp act fell, we, uh, the, the, the British government couldn't get through, made, made the terrible decision uh, to, to tax, obviously, what goes in. Uh, um, uh, teapots, which is tea. Uh, and here we have uh, the Boston Tea Party pouring uh, the tea into uh, the harbour. And accounts of the Boston Tea Party are like a sort of oil slick with this tea sort of flooding down to Dorchester. Uh, and on the side, um, um, watched supportively, dressed as mohawks, um, interestingly, um, as, as, as part of this act of of rebellion, right up to the Boston Tea Party, right up to the moment uh, of, of, uh, of disobedience and then onto the revolution. Boston was this incredibly uh, loyal, uh, royal uh, uh, city. Um, and it turns very, very quickly, in the case of a number of uh, uh, years, the move uh, from being such a loyal city, celebrating the birthdays of kings and queens, uh, to becoming this, this great citadel uh, of, uh, of insurrection. Um, they obviously suggest this was a great battle about no taxation without representation. We know it was just an attempt to keep smuggling routes open. <laughs> My second city um, looks at what goes with tea, which was, which was sugar. Uh, and I, I head to Bridgetown, Barbados. And the history of the British in the West Indies is a salutary and harsh reminder of the raw brutality, oppression, and racism involved in so much of the colonial project. The British became involved in sugar production from the late 1600s using techniques developed by the Dutch uh, and the Brazilians. 
but they could never get the indigenous Amerindians of the Caribbean uh, to work the land, nor could they actually get the Irish who they uh, exported there in the 1650s. So instead, between 1662 and 1807, British ships carried 3.25 million Africans across the Atlantic to America um, and uh, the Caribbean. And here, this is actually a depiction uh, of, of, of a French a sugar plantation. But you see the process of bringing in the cane uh, from the field, the crushing of the cane here in vertical rollers uh, down uh, into the barrels, taking it here uh, to be boiled uh, up um, into molasses, and all of it watched over uh, by the overseer uh, with the gun. And what the sugar industry did was turn the small island um, of Barbados into one of the richest land masses um, in the world and one of the most productive parts of the British Empire. The whole is a sweet spot of earth, said one visitor, not a span hardly uncultivated with sugar canes. All sides bend with an easy declivity to the sea and is evergreen. And again, I think you get the sense in this image of just how hard the land is worked. Um, and you would then in time see the entirety of it covered with windmills uh, because the crushing of the cane was then done uh, through, uh, through windmills. And here is Carlisle Bay, named after the Earl of Carlisle, one of the original uh, founders of modern uh, 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 Barbados, overseen by, by the forts here. And Brit Barbados comes particularly rich because it is the most easterly of the Caribbean islands. So this is the point of embarkation for the slaves coming from West Africa, who would then be distributed uh, across the other islands, mainly uh, to, uh, to Jamaica, which was growing much more uh, uh, powerfully than Barbados. But then it's also the export point for uh, the sugar coming out um, of, um, of the West Indies. Um, and in the process, the city of Bridgetown grows extraordinarily wealthy um, and rich as this great commercial uh, enterprise uh, for the sugar trade. And I think we know increasingly just how important that sugar and slavery was, both for the funding of the British Empire, the funding of the Royal Navy, the funding uh, of the army and the extension of imperial power, but also then uh, for uh, the initial seed capital for the Industrial Revolution um, and the infrastructure that went into Bristol uh, and Liverpool and London, uh, which was so important then for the growth uh, of capitalism in Britain um, in the late 18th century. Uh, so much of it connected uh, to uh, the history uh, of slavery. So my third city really completes the first part of this book, which is the Atlantic uh, Empire, uh, where Britain was um, in the 17th uh, and uh, 18th century uh, as this naval, quite light touch uh, uh, imperial uh, presence. Um, and Ireland, of course, was, has this very complicated place, and I think it's actually sort of historiographically getting more complicated place within the story of British imperialism. Because as we'll see, on the one hand, Ireland, in a sense, was England's earliest colony, the history of plantations uh, by the Scottish and the English uh, from the latter half um, of the 16th century, uh, a history going back, Ireland being part of the kingdom uh, of the kings of England, then becoming a colony, then becoming a plantation. And yet, during the course uh, of the 18th century, Ireland also becomes an imperial partner. Ireland also begins to do well out of empire. And the city of Dublin, in particular, uh, becomes another provisioning city for British uh, imperialism. Um, and as, as we know, during the course of the 19th century, so many of the, the engineers, the builders of empire, uh, themselves came uh, from Ireland. And what we see in the architecture of, uh, of Dublin is some of that plantation architecture uh, which was there in the huge plantations um, in Ulster and Northern Ireland. Uh, that colonial architecture, which itself comes from the Veneto, uh, being transposed into Dublin. Dublin begins to become, to begin to look like itself an imperial city. Here we have uh, Leinster House, now the seat um, of um, the Irish uh, Parliament, symbolic of that kind of late 18th century imperial architecture. And we don't often 
think sometimes uh, of, of Dublin as a colonial city. And yet when you look at the debates in the 1950s and 1960s about the redevelopment of Dublin, when you look at the destruction of the Georgian terraces uh, and the wrecking balls swinging through uh, uh, the terraces uh, and some of that incredibly beautiful Georgian townhouse architecture, this was a nationalist response to a colonial heritage. Georgian buildings are an offence to all true blue Irishmen. They are a hangover from a repressive past and they must go. Uh, was one correspondent uh, to the Irish Times. And you can see some of that in, in the architecture. This is the custom uh, house in Dublin, built in 1791. Um, and here you see, right in the middle, Britannia and Hibernia sort of cuddling up um, with a shell behind them, brought together in happy union. Uh, and what's bringing them together is, is trade uh, uh, and the wealth coming uh, from uh, across the empire. Um, and so th this, this sort of informal colonial relationship obviously then becomes uh, formal with the Act of Union uh, as Ireland joins uh, uh, Great Britain in 1800, uh, 1801. And the architecture then uh, of Dublin uh, becomes, in a sense, uh, even more uh, uh, imperial and colonial. Um, here, right in the middle, um, Sackville Street, um, Nelson's Column. Uh, and, yours, and, and the emergence of Nelson's columns right across the cities of the British Empire is remarkable. Uh, there's a particularly uh, uh, weak one, actually, uh, in Bridgetown, Barbados. Um, and again, so this architecture um, proved pretty um, unwelcome to a newly independent um, Ireland. Um, at a meeting of the Dublin City Council on the 7th of December, 1953, a letter was submitted from the Honourable Secretary of the IRA Dublin Brigade, enclosing a copy of a resolution adopted by the Dublin Brigade Council calling for the removal of Nelson's pillar. And this was basically the IRA saying, look, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. Uh, you know, we can put in the planning application or, you know, you could get it. So Dublin City Council didn't move with the relevant speed. So in 1966, uh, Nelson's column was blown up. So that's the first phase of the book, the Atlantic Empire. I then want to go um, uh, in the aftermath of the American Revolution, the loss of the, uh, uh, the colonies. Uh, I want to head towards what was known as the Second Empire and the growth of the British in, in, in India. Um, but to get there, I have to go uh, via um, my fourth city, um, which is... Uh, the master link of connection between the Western and Eastern world, the brothel and tavern of the two oceans, uh, the great city of Cape Town. Um, and the, the British loved Cape Town. Um, and they loved it when it was controlled uh, by uh, the Dutch. They loved, as we'll see, the architecture. They loved the drama of it. Here we have this this. this this beautiful um, cityscape uh, of, of Cape Town by this wonderful woman, Lady Anne Barnard, who's this incredibly intelligent late 18th century society woman who has this great sort of relationship with Henry Dundas, who's the, the Home Secretary um, and then Foreign Secretary. Um, and she, she marries, and, and she's, she sort of then ends up marrying a slightly slow diplomat uh, and goes out to Cape Town. Um, and there sort of, Wow society. Um, and what you have is sort of what, you know, what the British loved was these whitewashed uh, Dutch uh, uh, housing, very good sort of streetscaping. Here we're on top of the battlements um, of the fort. We've now got our, our Union flag, uh, but we also still have uh, the, uh, uh, the, the equipment that the Dutch uh, left behind in terms of uh, their, their systems of uh, pretty bad torture. But Cape Town begins, I suppose, in a European context as a provisioning station for the, the Dutch East Indiamen sailing down to the East Indies. Um, and it was, as you went around the Cape, this was an area where you could pick up fresh supplies. This is where you could get meat. Uh, this is where uh, you could uh, get um, fresh water. And the Dutch did it brilliantly, taking all the water uh, from Table Mountain uh, provisioning uh, these gardens where you would have 
uh, your fresh fruit, uh, laying out uh, a, a great townscape protected uh, by um, a fort, uh, bringing in meat uh, from the surrounding areas. And whilst this was a, a free port, whilst this was uh, a Dutch, uh, then, it was, then it was okay. Um, the, 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 the British didn't mind it being controlled by the Dutch. But in the aftermath of the French Revolution, France invades Holland. Uh, the, the, the Dutch colonies suddenly become at risk of becoming French colonies. And as one Royal Navy official put it, what was a feather in the hands of Holland will become a sword in the hands of France. So it would be impossible for the British to allow Cape Town to become a French colony and a French city because that would prevent them getting to India, that they would be prevented uh, from, as we'll see, all the wealth and power uh, in India uh, being um, uh, accessed. So in the uh, uh, um, late 1790s, early 1800s, there are a series of conflicts between the British um, and Dutch uh, to try and uh, get hold um, of, of Cape Town. It's taken by the British and then handed uh, back, and then finally and conclusively uh, taken by the British uh, in the 1810s and 20s. And it becomes a much more obviously a British uh, 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 city. Uh, Dutch is removed as the language of the civil uh, uh, service. Uh, you have a sort of classical uh, imperial governing system and the great symbols of civilization, above all fox hunting, uh, are, are introduced. Um, and, and the British loved Cape Town. It was the, it was the uh, partly because you'd been at sea for three months and then you saw uh, uh, the tablecloth over Table Mountain and that, those lovely cascading clouds coming down the mountain uh, and then the drama uh, of it uh, and then I think a sort of sense of European civilization with the, uh, the Dutch architecture um, uh, providing uh, a series, a, a sense of sort of a refuge. And it becomes this vital uh, point um, on the way uh, to where the British really wanted to get, which is my next city, the city of Calcutta. It was the riches and prosperity coming from the East India Company compounds in Bengal, which drove so much uh, of British imperial policy in the late 18th and 19th uh, century. Its capital and the capital of British India was Calcutta. Nothing could equal the magnificence of my approach to this town. For nearly three miles, the river, which is as large as the Thames at London, is bordered by lovely, well-built country houses with porticos and colonnades. The town is a mass of suburb palaces in the same style, with the finest fortress in the world. To the Victorian imagination, Calcutta would always be bound up more and more with the black hole of Calcutta and almost a, a fear uh, uh, of the imperial other. But what Calcutta symbolised for the late 18th, early 19th century was a place of extraordinary magnificence and riches. But for the story of imperialism and the idea of imperialism I'm interested in exploring, what Calcutta also suggests is this move in an idea of empire from that kind of seaborne vision of empire, our Atlantic empire, to a much more territorial sense, a much more Roman sense of imperial power. So just as Gibbon is writing the decline and fall uh, of the Roman empire, on the banks of the Hooghly, the British are trying to rebuild uh, another uh, British empire. And the man driving much of this um, is Richard Wellesley, the, uh, the, the brother of the man who would become the Duke of Wellington. Uh, Wellesley is Governor General um, of India. Um, he spends some time, some lovely time, with Anne Barnard um, in Cape Town before he comes uh, to Calcutta. Um, and Wellesley has this very strong idea that, that he thinks the British in India, that the British should rule India from a palace and not from a counting house. That the, the commercial vision of imperialism um, bound up with the East India Company, the taking of the extraordinary riches uh, from Bengal and using this as a sort of cash cow, wasn't really worthy uh, of British uh, morality uh, and virtue. And instead, what you wanted to create it was a much 
uh, a grander sense of empire. And so what he seeks to build in Calcutta is this territorial idea uh, of imperialism. Uh, and here we have a government uh, a house built on consciously neo-Roman uh, lines, modelled on Kedleston Hall, uh, Lord Curzon's uh, house in, uh, in Derbyshire. And Lord Curzon, being Lord Curzon, would live in both. Um, uh, and, and you get the sense in this, you know, this, this picture here of the representation of the dark town uh, of Calcutta with the light uh, of imperialism uh, and enlightenment uh, and modernity uh, and civilization uh, coming to uh, uh, India through the forces uh, of British imperialism. And this is the beginning, in a sense, uh, of the approach to the British Raj. This is the beginning uh, of a, a strong territorial footprint by the British um, in India. Um, and Wellesley goes through a series of battles to extend uh, British um, influence. Part of what created the wealth of Calcutta was textiles, extraordinary uh, 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 silks. But another element was opium. And this takes me uh, to my next city because opium was a big Calcutta export and it crept in a most mysterious and fascinating manner into the homes of the rich and poor and with its mystic fingers gripped the hearts of old and young, reported one shamed British missionary. Men became paralysed before this new force, and reason stood silent, and the highest ideals of human life slowly paled and vanished in the presence of this Indian mystery. So from the poppy fields of Bengal came a lucrative trade in this hugely addictive drug, and the most lucrative market for it was China. But understandably, the Chinese uh, were increasingly frustrated uh, by uh, the import of opium um, into their ports and uh, uh, increasingly clamped down on it. So the British needed a, a landing base for the opium trade. The British needed a point of entry uh, into the Chinese market, which could not be closed down uh, by the Chinese authorities. And they chose the fragrant harbour. Uh, they chose uh, Hong Kong. Um, and the people driving this with an extraordinary degree of control over British foreign policy uh, were Jardine and Matteson, uh, Jardine, Matteson uh, and company, the big uh, opium peddlers um, uh, of uh, the 1830s uh, and 40s, the men who would inspire the opium war, uh, the men who would uh, open up Hong Kong. And here they are. This is their go down. This is... Um, uh, their, uh, their, their factory, uh, and then there's their residence um, up above. Um, and Hong Kong uh, becomes this vitally important um, entry point uh, um, uh, into um, uh, the Chinese uh, market. Um, and like Cape Town, there was always a sort of real British love for Hong Kong. And when you read accounts of it, it's they always compare it to the sort of Scottish glens, that there's this mix of this sort of granite rock and the greenery and the spray um, and, and a sense of romance uh, uh, about uh, the landscape of Hong Kong. And Hong Kong becomes, in turn, this incredibly busy uh, uh, port um, um, for uh, the British, an enormously uh, powerful uh, uh, trading point uh, for the British, uh, seconded only uh, by Liverpool um, uh, and, sorry, after London, Liverpool, uh, Hong Kong uh, comes third. Um, and in its aftermath, the opening up of free ports uh, for British trade um, in, in China. And in terms then, again, of the, the ideology of empire, if, if Wellesley was about sort of moral virtue and territorial uh, uh, ambition, what Hong Kong was about was the beauty of free trade, that the Chinese just couldn't understand the civilizing merits uh, of open markets and free trade. Uh, and so through a sort of Palmerstonian gunboat, uh, it had to be opened up. Hong Kong, like Singapore, are these great symbols of the British belief in free trade uh, and an informal uh, empire. But Hong Kong was provisioned not only by um, Calcutta, but also by my next city, uh, the great city of Bombay. Here is 
Sir Jamsitsi Jijiboy, um, who is the great Parsi merchant, uh, who was uh, in partnership with Jardine and Matteson. Um, and what Jijiboy did uh, was to offer a new supply line of opium uh, into Hong Kong, not from Calcutta, uh, but from his city uh, of Bombay. And if, if Hong Kong was about the, you know, the beauty of the fragrant harbour, the nature. Bombay is my first urban industrial city. Bombay is my Birmingham and my Manchester, and it's all the more beautiful uh, for that. Um, Bombay comes alive really um, on the back of the, the American Civil War of the 1860s, because once um, the North the Yankees blockade the South. It means that the cotton exports from the American South can't get to Liverpool, can't get to the Manchester mills. So the British begin to look for a new trading partner. And Bombay starts to provision uh, Britain uh, with raw cotton, uh, with the textiles it needs. But then it begins to think, well, why are we doing this? Actually, uh, the British Empire uh, can, can be more self-sufficient, can create more wealth by running itself. So Bombay becomes a, an industrial, commercial city, grows like Birmingham and Manchester um, in the mid-19th century. And it celebrates that with this sort of brilliant kind of gourmand-gast, Balmoral, natural history museum, sort of uh, Venetian Gothic... Uh, chaos, um, and, and I love it. Here, here, we, here we have um, uh, the Victoria uh, Terminus train station, um, and then also uh, the Municipal uh, Corporation building, celebrating, in a sense, uh, a civic pride, celebrating uh, a, a civic um, identity, and everything George Gilbert Scott, and in fact, he, George Gilbert Scott you know, designs uh, 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 the, the university uh, library, and 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 this, so so this is this is you know, the Cadoro in Venice via Manchester to <laughs> Bombay, um, uh, and 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 this this was the, the British celebrating, not a sort of Roman Empire, not. Uh, the free trade vision, but actually an urban industrial ethic and a kind of mercantile pride with that. And it went with a Bombay spirit of wealth creation uh, and enterprise um, in terms of the architecture. Um, what I particularly uh, like about the, the style, which becomes known as Bombay Gothic, um, is, is, comes, comes from this design here. So this, so this, is, a, um, this is Crawford Market, uh, which uh, the authorities keep allowing to be sort of set on fire in the hope that one day it will fall down. Um, and in the middle of it is this lovely um, uh, water fountain uh, with these very kind of sort of Ruskinian naturalistic uh, imagery um, on it. Um, and the man who designed this is a man called John uh, Lockwood uh, Kipling. John Lockwood Kipling, uh, uh, before he went to uh, Bombay, taught at the Burslem School of Art in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, and he loved going to this beauty spot just north of Stoke, uh, which is still a wonderful place, uh, called Lake Rudyard. Uh, and so when his son was born on the grounds of the Bombay School of Art, uh, he called him Rudyard Kipling. Um, uh, people think Rudyard Kipling is a child of empire. We know he's a child of the potteries and was just sort of <laughs> transposed uh, over uh, to, uh, to India. My next city really sort of moves away from that kind of concentrated civic industrial sense to um, a suburban ideal, um, the great city of Melbourne. Nearly everybody who can lives in the suburbs, explained one visitor. It is strange that the Australian townsmen should have so thoroughly inherited the English love of living as far as possible away from the scene of his business and work during the day. <laughs> Just as the British cities developed a, a suburban architecture during the late 19th century. So you also saw this um, in, in Melbourne uh, and a great sort of um, celebration uh, of, uh, of you know, the, the, the blinds and all the artefacts uh, of domestic uh, living. The diary of a nobody could have been uh, also uh, posited in Melbourne. But what you also see in Melbourne is a very interesting idea, much of it based around the city, of, of where does imperialism 
lie? Where does the future of the empire exist? Because as fears over eugenic decline, fears over the state of cities like Stoke-on-Trent and Manchester and Birmingham, Liverpool grew, there was a sense that actually the future of the empire might lie in the sort of healthy cities of South Africa and Australia and Canada, the kind of what we would come to see um, as the white Commonwealth. And at the same time, in those colonies, there was a growing sense uh, of distance um, from the mother country. Um, and much of this was then explored through sport, uh, that you have a series of test matches. Um, you have a series of, of, of um, um, sporting teams, particularly cricket, coming to Australia. And there's this very crude test, in a sense, of the, the virility of the mother country versus uh, those living in the colonies and those growing up under the strong sun and the fresh fruit uh, and all of it. Um, this growing cycle of cricket tours from the 1860s becomes a vehicle for the exploration of Australian uh, and British identity. And during one of these uh, uh, tours, um, one of the newspapers writes, for all that the scepter has passed away, so to speak, the flag is struck. It may console them to note that the English race is not degenerating and that in distant lands and on turfs where lately the boomerang was hurled, a generation has arisen which can play the best bowlers of the time. Um, and back in Britain, then politicians like Joseph Chamberlain were thinking, well, this is the future of, of, of empire that actually an imperial federation connecting up through the Anglo-Saxon race, through the, the crimson thread of kinship, uh, would, would, would secure the future of Britain in the world against American and French competition. Few of us thought the very same arguments would be being made 120 years later. Um, but this, this language of sportsmanship then segues terrifyingly into the drumbeat towards the first World War. And what is so remarkable is that despite all that kind of testing, you see so many signing up to fight for the British Empire from the colonies. And one of the most terrifying poems that was read through the Australian schools, school system in the 1910s speaks of a team that is ready to take the field to bowling with balls of lead in a test match grim where if one appealed, the umpire might answer dead. My penultimate city is the, the Rome of Hindustan, the, the Versailles of the British Empire, New Delhi, um, created to show that the British Empire was going to last for thousands of thousands of years. Those who attempted to, to visit the construction of New Delhi almost found it hard to put into words what they saw in front of themselves. Robert Byron, the great travel writer, wrote, dome, tower, dome, tower, dome, red, pink, cream and white, washed gold and flashing in the morning sun. The traveller loses a breath and with it his apprehensions and preconceptions. Here is something not merely worthy, but whose like has never been. Um, and here we see just the, just the extent of it. Uh, the Viceroy's uh, 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 palace, the, the Secretariat on either side, uh, the Council Chamber, and now the Parliament, uh, the King's Way, um, and then on the side of it, the, construct, the beginning of the construction uh, of all um, the, uh, the bungalows um, to, to house um, the, 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 the civil servants and the army in an incredibly gradated uh, uh, way. The architecture... Um, was consciously imperial. L Lutchins's vision was that this was an architecture uh, which would last forever. And famously, the, 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 the bells were made of stone because they'd only ring when the British Empire was going to fall. So if you make them of stone, they're never going to ring. Um, and it, there was meant to be this timelessness about it. But what you see, obviously, um, 
is the, the incorporation uh, of so many indigenous um, architectural traditions. And again, in a sense, that was the brilliance of it, that what Lutchins and Herbert Baker wanted to show was that somehow the British Empire was not, as we saw with Calcutta and Wesley, this sort of imposition of a, a foreign civilization onto Indian soil. That actually, the British Empire grew out of the soil of India. It was a natural progression uh, after uh, um, uh, the, the empires of the past that you had the British Empire. And that's why they built a new Delhi, because Delhi was a city of many cities, uh, and this was going to be the next Delhi uh, to go upon the layers of history uh, that had been there uh, before. Um, now, not everyone uh, fully signed up to this view, and the, 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 the French Prime Minister, uh, Georges Clemenceau, uh, visited the construction site. He had this huge smile on his face. He said, ah, this will be the greatest ruin of them all. Um, <laughs> And it was, it was remarkable that, 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 that at the peak, in a sense, of British imperialism, they, they build this, uh, the, the, the society around it was incredible. You know, there was, you know, again, um, you know, Edward the, the Seventh uh, seeing what was, Edward the Eighth seeing what was being, being built um, and saying, oh, well, this, is, this is how kings actually live. Um, and there was, there was an enormity um, around it. And yet, it didn't fall away. What is remarkable about New Delhi um, is that a newly independent India immediately took up uh, the, the buildings, the fabric, the architecture, uh, almost naturally um, in terms uh, of, of what they needed. And so we, we almost end the story uh, with a cup of tea. We began with the Boston Tea Party, uh, and, and now we have uh, Gandhi and Mountbatten uh, on the steps of Viceroy's house uh, in 47. But my final chapter really is about a city made and unmade by empire. The wonderful, brilliant city of, of Liverpool. Um, a city called into being by the growth of imperialism, um, makes its money initially through the slave trade, extraordinary wealth coming out of slavery, and then in the aftermath uh, after the abolition of the slave trade, it becomes the export point for the finished goods uh, of, uh, of the British Industrial Revolution and the import point uh, for um, the um, um, goods from uh, the colonies grows and grows uh, through great wealth and then sort of celebrated uh, in this uh, sort of bombastic, the three graces um, architecture um, on, on the waterfront. And Liverpool is still a great trading imperial city right up to the 1950s. Um, the connections with West Africa continue, the connections uh, with Canada uh, uh, continue. Uh, Liverpool remains uh, this extraordinary prosperous um, uh, city on the back um, of empire and then Commonwealth. But then you see, as the British Empire begins to retreat, you also see the retreat of Liverpool. Um, and with Deindustrialization, with political leadership, which was not always the most effective, but, all, but also with the retreat of empire, Liverpool begins to decline alongside cities like Glasgow at a rate of knots. And the, the sort of symbol for this is, in a sense, the closure uh, of the Tate factory um, in Liverpool, because the move from empire to Europe um, is marked the move from sugar cane to sugar beet, uh, and then the import from Europe is this sort of symbolic moment that when we enter the European community, that Liverpool finds itself on the wrong side of history uh, and the wrong side um, of uh, geography. Um, there is a sort of coda in some of this about the European Union and the rebuilding of Liverpool. Um, but in the 70s and 80s, Liverpool finds itself uh, in, in dire straits. Uh, and we reached the Nadir uh, in 1981. No city, I think, was more affected 
uh, by the end of empire. The move away from a British economy based around raw material production on the edges of empire and manufacturing production at the core could only signal a killer blow to the shipping, storage, insurance, finance, trading and general entrepot activities uh, of Merseyside. Um, and the, the, the decline we see culminating um, in the Toxteth riots would suggest the story uh, of the rise uh, and fall uh, of empire. But that's not quite where my story ends. Because the, across the former cities of the British Empire, one can trace now the impact of new rising powers. And one can also trace the end of empire here in the UK. So finally, I look at how the rise and fall of empires affected not only the history of former colonial cities, but also the story of our recent urban past. And nowhere more so than in Liverpool, because Liverpool's civic leaders have concluded that their regeneration lies with the Remnimbi. The city has twinned with Shanghai. Uh, it's actually just recently tried to sell Everton to a, a Chinese uh, a, a, um, a, a consortium. Uh, it has spruced up uh, Chinatown, um, and it has, through uh, an organisation called the Peel Group, uh, sought to create something called Liverpool Waters. This is uh, a remarkable um, example of what is described in Merseyside as Sino-Scouse collaboration. Um, uh, and this is, this is Shanghai Tower, um, not built. Um, here, we, here we have the Three Graces. Here we have the wonderful Museum of Liverpool. Here we have literally the worst building to be given planning permission in Western Europe. It's a terrible <laughs> block of flights. And then, and then here we have new uh, turnaround dock facilities. Um, and then here uh, was go is going to be, through Peel Ports, um, this um, Liverpool Waters project funded uh, through Chinese investment uh, to, uh, to rebuild um, uh, and revitalise um, the uh, Liverpool um, economy, a £10 billion uh, pound scheme. What's more, with that goes um, an ambition to really open up the old Manchester ship canal so that you can get Chinese ships uh, coming down the ship canal to sort of modern go-downs uh, modern, huge modern factories um, uh, and warehouses for the landing of imported uh, uh, manufactured goods from China. So whereas once upon a time, it was produced in Manchester out of the ship canal to Liverpool around the world, now um, it's in being inverted. But not everyone is happy. In 2010, the Wirral Society of Local Conservationists condemned those quotes who are dead set on restructuring the riverside entrance into the port of Liverpool in the style of Sydney, New York or Shanghai. In the diffident language of a regional conservation group, they suggested it is very feasible that many Wirillians will not like the idea of being Shanghai. <laughs> but new empires are rising and their force will be felt in a new generation of imperial cities across the globe. Thank you very much.